Now, now, this is the week in which we usually have on our guests that we've had for the last wee while, former ACT MP, talk to review of the, review the week, preview the week coming, um, and also give her, us her take on, um, well, some of the social, cultural, political movements that have been happening in the country. Former ACT MP, former city councillor, former regional councillor, uh, lawyer, uh, property owner, uh, and very skilled commentator and columnist, Hilary Colvert. Hilary, welcome. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Michael. Um, just on that, uh, your city, Dunedin's, been going through some sort of, um, it seems, angst over your educational institution, Otago University. At the moment. I had Professor Brian Roper from there on yesterday. Um, it's not looking good, is it, for Otago University at the moment? Well, I think they've just sort of oh, lost their way somehow. And it's interesting to watch today had, I think, in the ODT something about the Polytech, who's also struggling with numbers of students gone down. And they look positively like grown-ups in mm. comparison. Mm. Um, the university, it's sort of, they've just got paralysed. You can, but they look like rabbits caught in headlights, really. really and I, they've got to be able to find a way through. They're smart, aren't they? Well, no. Well, it, 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 that's the interesting thing that you say that. It's a bit like school teachers, can I say, university lecturers. So let me get this right. If I'm a university lecturer, and by nature I'm a nerd, right? So I'm I'm unlikely to be one of a people of the world. I'm I'm an academic. So I head off into the academic cloisters of let's just say Otago University, Hillary. Um, and I become a teacher, a lecturer, and I, 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 I sort of climb up the greasy pole and I might eventually become a professor of something. But then, I having, you know, lectured in phenomenology of religion or, I don't know, marketing or um, um, pol political studies or something, they then make me the vice-chancellor. And now I'm in suddenly in charge of a multi-million dollar industry uh, with 25,000 students and God knows how many other staff and I'm meant to have all the commercial smarts to be able to make that work. It, it's rather an exercise in conceit, isn't it? Well, I guess it's the sort of you get in the background. Um, it reminds me of some of the better CEs I've seen who will tell you, of local body CEs, um, that their job is to make the political people look good. And the way they achieve that, when they do achieve it, is by giving good, sound advice, helping the political people understand what to do and what not to do to achieve their objectives. Um, so I can only think that somehow there isn't the people in the university council who think their role is to um, make the university and decision-making processes look good. Yeah, I mean the university councils. Uh, just for those of you who are, uh, they are, they are sort of the um, the governance team that run universities. Um, again, flooded with academics, not necessarily people who have a business background. And and political appointments. Ah, oh, I forgot about that. Yes, four. And yes. since eighty percent of the money comes from the government. Oh yes, yes. It, so it does have political appointments mm. and. Unfortunately, when we have um, not only a lot of the university people have done learning and then kept on through the education system, so they haven't spread themselves out to do other things in the world necessarily, which is a very focused approach, um, but if you add on their um, appointments from the government when those people haven't ever been out of either academic world or the government, then you've got a double whammy, haven't you? Yeah. So you've, uh, got, you've got a disaster a waiting to happen. So yeah. And so when something like this happens... Yeah, left, that, left wing mm. political appo appointees, they're yeah. much less likely to have been out much in the... In the I was just stopping myself say real world, but um, a different world, so... Uh, Which more. would provide a different balance. Okay. Uh, I've, uh, as a result of a conversation that I've had with both NZUSA's president this morning and with Professor Roper yesterday, 
it seems clearly obvious that um, their solutions, both of them, uh, from both a staff member's point of view but also from a student's perspective, is that the government just needs to put more money in. But I think both of them admit, in fact, NZUSA did, that the whole tertiary sector is in disarray and that there is required some sort of radical reform of the institution in general. Do you concur with that? I think if we went back to to basics and try and figure out what they're doing there, what's the point of them, because we've lost the point, I think. Um, they were a place back when you and I went where you were supposed to be able to express opinions that were poorly thought out and poorly formed and the same as last year's poorly formed opinions, but they were your own <laughs> and you're allowed to have them and your job when you're writing things was to argue for your opinions and some people would turn out to after years of a time have some quite good opinions but it was a place for the free exchange of ideas and things and the technical sort of knowledge in a scientific thing so you didn't argue for positions like the earth flat on the whole unless you were doing philosophy mm. but so it was based on some sort of science sort of thing but we seem to have completely lost the plot of what they're doing there and the problem with the government having another look is that they might think our major task of what we're doing there is um, for example to uphold um, treaty principles that we don't understand or something mm. wouldn't want the government to have a good look into what university, uh, universities are doing I think they should get back to what they used to do um, and there are too many people going to them as well, to be perfectly honest with you, and that's diluted the academic heft of them too. Um, and it's pretty obvious that they're failing because uh, we just talked about this morning, what, the eight, 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 Australian, eight Australian universities in the top 100 are ranked in the world, not one, New Zealand one. And only one New Zealand university in the top 200, and that's the University of Auckland. So Otago's fallen out of that as well. Um, all right, moving yeah, on. And at, Sorry, Carol? Yeah, just a last little bit on that. When you look at this, like in the ODT... Today, it, rather than people being able to have opinions and vigorously argue them and do that part of their job, they've said the University of Otago has warned it will consider any further questioning about the token poll culturally insensitive. Oh, I saw that. Now, now so, where please. have we got to that? I yeah. saw that. Incredible. Um, okay, perhaps explain this. Oh, this, this, will, um, this is new, though, um, for people who um, will not be aware of the story. In fact, it won't have moved outside Dunedin. But, boy, it's illustrative of why these people can't solve their own problems. Um, there is uh, the University of Otago have, as I understand, um, commissioned a Maori sculpture. Is that correct? I don't know whether they commissioned it. What they say is that it's a joint project for the University of Otago and Mana Whenua and they go on to say, I will be proud to unveil it at the appropriate time. That's how the, this article finishes. So they've got a sculpture that is, it's got a name, it's a, what is it? Um, I'm not sure, but I call, I'm calling it a token poll because at the moment that's what it seems to be. Um but it's been sitting there wrapped up for, well, it seems like years, but possibly a year or something. And so it's some sort of joint thing and there's something holding up its unveiling. So it's been sitting there and it looks like it's about finished. But it was, rumour has it that it was put there and it, maybe it's not in the right place, maybe it doesn't give proper prominence to mana whenua at the gateway of the university or perhaps there's a problem with how we unveil it or perhaps there's a problem that it hasn't been properly blessed or who would know but they were refusing to talk about the ODT has been onto their case and saying when is it happening and what is it and why can't we see it and how much does it cost the University of Otago refuses to say how much it'll cost um, because it would prejudice the commercial position of contractors that's unbelievable um, and it might, um, they can't talk about it because tikanga Māori needs to be respected 
Right. Just to, to explain um, to the rest of our listeners, Po Fenua, a P O U and then Fenua, P H W H E N, Po Fenua, they carved wooden posts. Okay, so they go straight up. Um, so they're wooden posts. Yeah. You, you would see them in places. They're used by Maori um, to mark territorial boundaries or places of significance. Um, and they're generally artistically and elaborately carved. You'd see. You'd see them in Rotorua and places like that and can be found throughout New Zealand, um, the, yes. The, they, so that's a po whenua. They're basically totem poles, okay? Um, yes. And, and, but, but with Maori carvings that go all the way up them, usually it's um, a, a sort of Maori figurine down the bottom who's got lots of heads and they, they keep on going up until you know, they get to the end. But the, the, no, the remarkable thing about this is that Clearly, Otago University commissioned it or was paying for it, otherwise they wouldn't be responsible for it. They're putting it on their own campus. But, no, it was the thing that struck me is when a newspaper, in this particular case, doing its job, just said, hey, come and can you ask how much cost and when it's going to actually happen, said, and I quote, in light of this, this is the response to Otago University to the media, we consider any ongoing information requests in relationship to the Po Whenua to be of a vexatious nature. In other words, you're pissing us off and culturally insensitive. In other words, you're a bastard. I mean, yes. that's an extraordinary response from an agency that is taking vast amounts of government taxpayers' money, refusing to answer fair enough questions. Like, why, how much does that cost and when are you actually going to let it go? Stunning. Yeah, so, yeah. That's, if that's where they're going... Yeah. No wonder, they're not going to get much sympathy for the rest of us, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> they're looking for understanding. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they make me laugh. Um, academics. Yeah. Now, just yeah. on the next issue uh, here, um, the big issue, of course, um, well, it's in the beltway, but I think in actual fact it, 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 there wouldn't be a, an anti-vaxxer, an anti-mandator, a conspiracy theorist, uh, or anybody um, at all of that ilk, but equally on the centre-right of the political equations either, who wouldn't have felt some degree of I told you so this week um, after news of Radio New Zealand and its uh, so-called independent investigation, it's certainly not, um, as a result of doctoring international news stories to provide a clearly Marxist bias um, in that particular agency of our public broadcaster. You've been following this issue? Yes, and interestingly, it's um, friendly, uh, uh, it's equivalent issue on the BBC, who's had problems too. And it's interesting to me that last October, I think it was, some people told Radio New Zealand, a little collection of people, Ukraine and Russian people, I gather, they said, you're, this is crap what you're doing, you know, you're screwing the scrum. And Radio New Zealand did nothing. So them saying last Friday when we found out about it, we immediately moved on it. No, they didn't. That was bullshit. Um, last October they were told and they didn't look into it at all. And the BBC has had some of the same problem. The BBC in a, a um, interesting response, one of them said... Look, these are difficult times we live in and all I can say to you is that you should be really careful about the new news and things you consume. Mm. So what I would say, and I want to say here, and you can't, but I can, I think, um, good on the platform because the point behind all this stuff is that the best way of understanding whether something's bullshit or whatever it is, is to get views from a variety of places and to allow opinions, not to tell people they're culturally insensitive or any of that crap, but to allow opinions to come through. And when the BBC people are saying, be careful about what you listen to, the answer is not to listen to less and only trusted sources, because as we know now, and the RNZ's saying it themselves, they can't be trusted. It's to listen to more of them. Yes. I mean, a variety of sources, you're saying. Yes. Yes. Um, which is always the right way to do it. But um, I think, do we all... So, yes, but for a long time, Radio New Zealand, gosh, even when Sean was uh, helming their morning programme, morning report, was always perceived as being, you know, red radio. Um, but, gee, this just panders and plays to that bias or that rather that perception pretty well, doesn't it? Yes. And 
and that's um, interesting enough, the first response of Radio New Zealand tended to be, um, could you, when they were asked to go on Media Watch or something to talk about it, they refused to make themselves available. Mm. They yes. didn't want to talk about it. And they're now saying independent inquiry, which the board will supervise, or which that effect, not independent, clearly. Um, and they're very embarrassed about it. Um, but can, can I ask you another thing, though, on, on this? Could the same criticism, I mean, uh, th there is now the question is, should there be a proper independent inquiry? So essentially a ministerial inquiry or, or invoked by a minister um, to look at whether or not there's bias. Now, Willie Jackson doesn't bring going down that line, but of course Willie Jackson's always been accused of influencing public broadcasting anyhow, whether it's directly um, or through the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Um, so there is that sort of overlay to this as well. The new team that's been set up to do the independent review include Linda Clark, who has always been on the left-hand side of politics, Willie Akel, who I have to say, I said to Biz, gosh, he's getting on, although he certainly does have uh, good media perspectives, and somebody else, uh, some bureaucrat, technocrat, whose name I can't remember. Is that going to reassure the public? Um, or do, uh, Because now other stories have coming out, written by the same individual, written by others, that suggests yeah. bias is extended well beyond reporting on the Russian-Ukraine oh, conflict. Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. yeah, and it's now going into a whole series of others, international and national stories as well. This morning, for example, I've gone through all of the stories that have been written by this individual, uh, Michael Hall, I think his name is, um, and he's done a lot of national stories as well. So he's not just some jobbing sub-editor working out of Wangarei. He is somebody who has been contributing over a number of years to stories that have been published on a national scene by uh, Radio New Zealand. At that point, can we honestly believe that Radio New Zealand will A, tell us the truth, or B, will actually do an independent inquiry? No, and I don't think actually putting it under the minister <laughs> yeah, I know. doesn't help because no. the ministers then do the same thing. The ministers mm. tell them what they want to hear tell them what they need to come up with. We can't have an independent um, one accountable to the minister either. Um, and that's part of the contracting problem. You know, we've now got everybody's contracted instead of being part of government policy, sort of. And so now the people who are contracting think, I won't get my next job if I come up with the wrong thing for this one. So it's a, I'm not going to believe a word they say, but the sad thing in a sense, is that most of us who listen to this sort of stuff aren't surprised. Yes. You know, yeah. we, we look at it and think, oh, yeah, mm. of course, mm. you know. What's the story here? We didn't expect any better from them, mm. which is disappointing, isn't it? Mm. And that's just sad, sad that um, we've got to that state of affairs in this country. Uh, that's that's, that's yeah. because we're in our negative, whiny, um, wet phase, um, as Christopher Luxon would say. Or didn't say. Um, Hilary, now, moving on, and that segues rather nicely into this next part. That is, you're a former ACT MP, uh, when ACT was by no means as popular as it is now. Um, they are still seeming to climb up the polls. They are well, it followed. There was an earlier part where it had more MPs than the time I was there. Right. Incidentally. But having said that, um, they yeah. look like they're going to get a truckload of MPs in the next yeah. election. Um, David Seymour's kept them, I think, incredibly internally disciplined. Um, they are on message, so whenever we've interviewed ACT MPs on this show, they're on point. Um, they don't stray into areas they don't know about uh, and don't opine on issues that they're not aware of, um, unlike, you know, just about all the rest of us. Or um, care about. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm interested in where you think they go because it seems to me that if Christopher Luxon and we all know has got personality and um, projection problems uh, and I was just talking to David Farah, um, the Kiwi blog and um, Curia um, pollster yesterday, yesterday yeah. and he was pointing out that, uh, you know, Luxon's still in negative territory when it comes to public perception uh, and Hipkins is still in positive territory uh, and that that gap uh, might be decreasing a little bit, but there's still a gap and a quite a sizable one. Um, it, it leads to the question of if Christopher Luxon's going to stay as leader of the National Party, and there's no question he will, he's, got, he's only got four months to go of the election. Um, does that mean that ACT will continue 
to cannibalise national party support, particularly in provincial and rural New Zealand? Yeah, I don't think it's so much... Well, I wouldn't describe it as cannibalising their support. I think that um, Luxon has um, not made a transition to being a politician as some, and he's up against people who have been nothing but politicians since they were at university, you know. Um, And so they're really highly skilled in being political. And he's just, that's not him. And what you would notice is that when National's doing well in the discussions and things, like it has been for the last week or so, you know, their people are doing well. And when they're doing well, he looks better. He's not at his best when he's back-footed or defending, which is, I think, partly why the mainstream media has silly cracks at him for sillinesses. Um, But he gets back-footed because he says something that normal people would say, but he gets pinged for it. And they... So he's he then gets defensive and then he tries to be a person that would want to be electable and things. And he would... When he's comfortable in his own skin, he's quite good. Mm. So I think what's happening is that people who don't want Labour want a change of government and that especially women... And I'd be interested to see what the mix of women and men are in Act now, for Voting Act, um, they're just not not loving Luxon. And so, but they do want to change and they'll go to Act. So they're not thinking, and Act seems sensible enough. Mm. They're mm. doing well. Um, and so they're thinking, we'll still get a change of government if we have Act. And the more Act there is in there, the better, because we like them. So, I think it's a... Um, a but is it also a trust extension. issue here? I mean, is there a trust issue that somebody like yourself, somebody, well, not like yourself, because you've obviously, you know, been an ACT MP, but somebody like myself, somebody who might be on the centre-right of it, is going to vote ACT or is thinking about voting ACT because we do not trust Christopher Luxon to be, to hold the centre-right line, that once he gets to Wellington, coming from that corporate Air New Zealand background... Yeah he will choose the path of least resistance and that if we want to provide some steel, we need ACT to give that steel to that combination. What do you think? I hadn't heard that that before, but I can can imagine that being a a thing. I think he's... um, I don't think people... The person who might be the Prime Minister needs to be sort of known and loved necessarily as a person I think he's it, it's a pity he's not a, a more political politician um, because that's more significant I think than whether we I don't think people don't trust him I, I just don't he's sort of not um, not political he doesn't soothe people and say the right things alright um, and, and what else have you been thinking over the last week? Uh, those are the three big issues that have come up here. I, listen, they're not going to go away either. Um, those ones. Yeah. Um, the, you were saying something at some point, I can't remember where I heard it, um, about the anti-vaxxers and stuff like that, where, we, where we've where we left some of those. Oh, yes. Um, um, so, yes, it's a bit of a thesis of mine. So here it goes very simply. It goes like this, uh, Hilary. My thesis is that there there was always an anti-vaccination movement in this country, sort of anti-fluoridation, anti-1080, right? They were always out there. We knew that. And they were in, they had their own parties in actual fact, like Ban 1080 Party, uh, Freedom and Outdoors Party, I think there was the Sue, Sue Gray-led one. They were always out there. And then when along came... COVID, my thesis is that a whole series of people who weren't any of those, uh, but who were objecting to have to mandatorily vaccinate themselves, got mandated out of a job. So they suffered a direct financial and economic uh, and social, in actual fact, ostracisation, if you like, by government policy. And so they were sort of driven into 
the hands or the arms of these people who were already there. So those numbers have exponentially increased, and um, and, I, and I, that's just my thesis. So, but you see, now COVID's over. How do I keep that group of people in the tent? So I was talking about Greenpeace and, um, and other such causes. You've always got to have a new cause, don't you? So you've always got to have something else that will emotionally motivate your base to keep on staying within the tent. Otherwise, it'll just, you know, they'll sort of, people will sidle back to where they used to be prior to uh, 2020. Do you think that that's, that's a fair thesis? Well, yeah, I think so. And I think it's easier now that um, we're trying to polarise people. We're trying to polarise people on the basis of race and on the basis of other, whether you call it woke or non-woke or, or virtuous or whatever it is. So um, we used to think there was people who disagreed with us and we could be quite fond of them and we completely, I mean, they were loony tunes as far as within our heads, but it was fine, you know, you could go and have a beer with them. Um, but, for example, flat earth people. People could believe that the earth was flat and things, and they didn't make any difference to anyone else. They just had beliefs that just didn't coincide with most people. And But we didn't feel a need to fight with them about it. We didn't need no, that's to right. You're right. feel a need to we, tell We them just sit there and go, oh, you're weird, and we carry on have the beer. Yes, you're right, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now, you can't have opinions that um, disagree with the major lot of people without somebody saying you are <coughs> loony and you shouldn't be allowed to say it, either because you're culturally insensitive, as mm -hmm. the university has just suggested, or because science doesn't agree with you or whatever. Like, And we used to make people do things like wearing a seatbelt. The Brits were sort of didn't care much for wearing seatbelts and things. And in the end, they came around to it too. Um, so there's people who didn't want to wear them and said, we should be allowed to not wear um, a seatbelt if we want to. And people said, well, actually, if you're going to drive a car, you're going to have to wear a seatbelt because otherwise the rest of us have to pay to have the hospitals. And the um, vaccination thing has got some of the same bits about it. You know, we have always, society-wise, controlled people who do things that affect other people's chances or, you know, like we want you vaccinated because if you didn't get vaccinated, um, you fill our hospital full, whatever it is. But we disagreed with people and we didn't go feral about the whole thing. So now people are going feral about people they disagree with. And so it's a collection of people who feel that other people are treating them badly, fairly. Yeah. Well, and, and to be fair, word. when you have to lose your job for making a choice that the Bill of Rights Act seemed to give you, then I don't... Can I just say I've got no problem with anti-vaxxers going feral because I don't care if you're anti-vaccination. Yeah. It's your choice. Um, there'll be enough of us the rest of us to get vaccinated. And I always remember the start of that campaign, Hillary. You know, remember, you know, ran across the front page, banner of the ODT New Zealand Herald, get 90% of the adult New Zealanders at things and we'll be fine. Well, we got over 90%, 92%, I think, in the end, but we still mandated those people out of a job. And, and they were well, in jobs actually, which they couldn't possibly harm anybody yeah. else because theoretically we, there was herd immunity. And guess what? There wasn't. We didn't get over 90% for Maori. Oh, what do you do? Would be my answer to that. Yeah, well, and is that the reason that so, you mandate everybody else out? Yes. So, and so then, I mean, we should be having the discussion about whether we say to people, you can um, not be vaccinated, but you can't leave your home, or whether you can not be vaccinated, but well, See, that the hospital argument to me is a bit weak in the sense oh, that pathetic. people yeah. people drink and drive yeah. end up in hospital exactly. taking yeah. Yeah. taking, yeah, taking drugs, bashing people up and stuff. God yeah, exactly. I mean it's, it's a crazy and argument. Yeah, so some of that stuff is just crap. But we should be able to have the conversation and just in the end come up with something but we can't. People are just vicious and feral about the whole thing. And so what 
those alienated people that you say are always looking for a cause, now they're just, whenever they pick up a cause, they go feral and they think that they've got a right to behave very poorly. And you can see why people feel that because what the government's doing is increasingly telling people their crap for disagreeing with them. And then we've got a reason to see what yep. interested me this in the last week about the things people should be allowed and not allowed to do. We should not be locking people up in prison for 23 hours a day. And we should not be doing that because, I mean, we've told them if they do bad things, we'll lock them up. And being in prison is, is the punishment. It's not being in isolation. Hello, That's I've, a really bad, bad thing to do. Fair enough. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, Hilary. I've got to go. Nice to talk to you again. I uh, wish you well for the rest of the week.